We're at the 2019 CROI in Seattle, and we're here with Monica Gandhi, who's going to talk about uh, measurements in, uh, in, measure, in uh, women's issues, and also uh, ARVs. Yes. And I think you're, you have a presentation, so we'll let you talk to that. So, you know, the year, this year there was a lot of attention, a lot of focus on this question of the dolotegravir um, and uh, leading to neural tube defects. Um, we don't know if it's causal. We, it, there were four cases uh, born of um, women in Botswana who had been on dolotegravir early in pregnancy, and there was unfortunately um, these neural tube defects that occurred in the babies. And so because of that, there's been a renewed focus on how are we looking at antiretrovirals in pregnancy and for reproductive age of women. And though we spend time at every CROI to varying degrees talking about ARVs in women, there's a renewed focus on ARVs in women of reproductive age and um, their contraceptive choices prior to reproduction and then during pregnancy. What do we know? And so this entire panel um, on Tuesday afternoon, the symposium is focused on what do we know, and importantly, what do we not know mm -hmm. about antiretrovirals in women. And um, I was preparing the talk that is to be uh, focused um, more on high income settings, so US uh, and Europe, and Canada, Canada, Australia, more of that setting about what we do with ARVs in women. And I started out with this slide of all the ARVs we have in 2019, and then mm -hmm. had to cross out everything we don't know about in pregnancy or you can't use in pregnancy. Yeah, we, we didn't learn yet. And yeah, we were left yeah. with a lot of cross outs and yeah. a lot, just relatively few drugs yeah. that are truly approved in pregnancy, not because they're unsafe, mm -hmm. because we don't know. And mm -hmm. that is, I think, the big focus that we're trying to bring attention to is how much we don't know. One of the panelists speaking, Dr. Ann Lyerly from UNC, is a bioethicist, and she is going to make the comment that it is unethical not to study it in women. We used to, to twist that around. People would say, oh, it's unethical to study mm -hmm. drugs in pregnant women. She's saying it's unethical to have this little knowledge about what to do during pregnancy mm -hmm. for HIV or for any. Sooner disease. or later, you have to study it. Yes. So it's a matter of when. Yes. Maybe it's if it's too early, to, you have to let the first trials go to. But then, do you always see it as a phase four or? No, how it's a great question. Yeah. Um, drug companies have been criticized for saying, let's do the women in phase four. Let's get the mm -hmm. drug out the door. And then once it's marketed, and of course people are prescribing it for women, then, oh, let's do the TAC on phase four trial. I would, and many people at the NIH and the FDA would say, you have to enroll adequate numbers of women from the very get-go so that when you present data to the FDA, you have sex stratified analyses. You know how the drug fared in women and you know how it fared in men. Mm -hmm. And that would be, that would be what, the guidelines would say that was what the FDA would say. We don't mm -hmm. enforce it, but that's what they would say. Mm -hmm. So we're, it looks like we're, we're um, advancing. And I, I was at the CURE meeting the other day, and there's so little that's being done in yes. pediatrics and, uh, and women. I, I think we, you know, we have that ethical question. And it's, and it's is, it, is it good? Is it bad? Is it a, uh, risks and risk versus benefit? And Well, let me tell you, you about know. one other poster here that we have, which was interesting related to this question. So we have a group in the ACTG called the, the WISC, which is the, um, it's focusing on women in HIV. And two years ago, we wrote the CROI program committee. And we said, you know, um, we don't actually have a line when you write the people who get into CROI that they should always present sex delineated uh, information if they can. And so the CROI program committee of 2018 was very responsive. And they wrote to every oral and poster presenter, but specifically oral, absolutely, if you have that data, put, it, put in sex distribution and put in sex uh, delineated outcomes if you can and if you can't say why not. Mm -hmm. And then we did an analysis, and this is poster mm -hmm. 916 mm -hmm. in the poster mm -hmm. hall. Oh. And we did an analysis where we all watched the oral abstracts online. We took notes and we did an analysis where two reviewers looked at every oral abstract and we asked, were those guidelines followed? Mm -hmm. And 24% of abstracts that were presented orally that could have something to say about sex, because of course we excluded ones that were exclusively mm -hmm. in MSM. Right, right. Um, right. Only 24%, uh, pre a quarter presented sex delineated outcomes or said why. So mm -hmm. we, even from in 2019, we're presenting data from CROI 2018 that mm -hmm. shows we're not, we're not even showing the data, even if we have it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to raise awareness of in the WISC and other groups that look at HIV and women. I think the one thing that our audience would probably, there's so much they don't know. Science is so complicated and presenting is a very huge piece of it. Peer review process is yes. very important. 
And when you come to the conference, you have a lot of data. Whenever I'm, whenever we're presented material at a, uh, a meeting that we're talking with a company about their, their drug data, we generally get what they want us to see. Yes. And then we have to tease out what did they not show us yes. that they may not have been too happy about. So we have to find those things out. And that may be the problem. It, it, they we, may not yeah. even know what they don't know, actually. Yeah. They like, may not even have it on their radar mm -hmm. how important it is to think that men and women are different pharmacogenetically mm -hmm. or in terms of their responses. So these guidelines have been out. Um, there was a report by the Institute of Medicine in the 90s. I mean, there, there has been constant talk of that we need to do this for drugs, mm -hmm. but it, it's easier to just, it's easier to not, um, I think, tease, to be honest, in the study design, they may not have recruited enough women to mm -hmm. even look at to, those to make it So then it's the data. right thing to say, we don't know. And mm -hmm. even that's what we're saying, even at Croy and other major meetings, if you don't have enough data, then say we could not perform sex stratified analyses because we didn't have adequate numbers of women, because then it highlights the issue. But as far as drugs coming to market, yes. there has been said, I know like uh, John Pottage from Vive said, he will not bring a drug to market that cannot be used in pediatrics and adolescents and so forth. That's great. And, and I, I'm pretty sure he'll support, continue to support that statement. Yeah. But um, I'm not sure if everybody else is on board with that. And but right. that means they have to do testing up front to know if it's going to be, it's going to work. They do. A good example is the DISCOVER trial is going to be a big deal here. So this is mm -hmm. TAF FTC versus TDF FTC mm -hmm. for um, PrEP. The study design chose to only enroll men and transgender women. Mm -hmm. So we will, when we get the results on Wednesday morning, I cannot extrapolate those results to my cisgender women. It would not be mm -hmm. right. There was no women in there that were cisgender. Right. We have to say also for our audience that this is happening early and before the conference really began. Yes. But you're bringing this stuff to the conference so you know about what you speak. Yes. But uh, there's a lot of other uh, presentations, but we allow, we embargo them until they're presented. Yes, yes. And then we also, um, you know, uh, there's a way at the end to continue to evaluate in this peer process, not only in front of the posters, but in such settings like this. What was presented. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yes. So it's, yes. it's always exciting. And we always appreciate you coming. But do you have any, any more that you want to throw out there? Um, just one more thing that I think there's been an increasing focus at Croy's on adherence, because mm -hmm. uh, adherence is um, after the prep trials, we realized that people don't take drugs every day um, when they're, especially when you're doing it for prevention. Who does? That's hard to take your aspirin every day or to take your you know, blood pressure medication every day. When you feel well, it's hard to take a medication every day. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of interest in adherence metrics. And though we, ha our group had looked a lot in drug levels in hair, um, what we'll be presenting um, later in the meeting is looking at drug levels in urine in a way that it's a point of care assay. That mm -hmm. you're so just it's much in the easier. clinic. It's easier. Yeah, yeah, you take urine, you <coughs> dip it, you look mm -hmm. at a strip test, you sort of say yes, no, whether uh, they're taking tenofovir, and then you can help modulate your counseling around the fact that you have an objective mm -hmm. adherence measure in a motivating way. So you're suggesting a lot of people that feel good say, oh, I'm cured, or there's been that said. Yes. We had that in the cure meeting, yes. the, the oh, pre-conference cure I'm meeting. Sure, yeah. It's It's very, uh, you very, well. very, very concerning that yes. people sense that, oh, they feel good, so now they're cured. And they also say that they're undetectable. Yes. They think that means that they're un that they're cured. Yes. So we really do need to educate, uh, not only in uh, Africa or other, but in the United States too. Oh yeah. Because people get this up there in their mind that this is the cure. Yeah, you feel well. Because they keep well. talking about the cure. Yes, no, you're yeah. right. That's a very good point. Having an undetectable viral load from medications is mm -hmm. not cure, but it requires Means you're at a very good point to gain in your, in the medication. Yeah, yeah. And so you're right, that adherence, <clears throat> means a lot and it's exhausting it's a, you know people get pill, pill fatigue and so mm -hmm. the question is how how do we keep people motivated mm -hmm. when they feel well it's exciting that they feel well that's wonderful right. and how do we keep people motivated and then and that we knew how we do have down we one pill a day was of course magical for a lot of people yeah. but when we have a drug that needs to be taken now quarterly or or every few months or yes. something that will be a, that'll be another at this meeting that will another opportunity yes. yeah another yes, opportunity for exciting. drug choice yeah well, it's, it's very exciting. The conference is always uh, full of little things that amount up to be a big 
yeah. thing. Yeah, Croix as a, as a, is, as a is always exciting. Whole. I call it Christmas, by the way. My, I was like to the fellows, you just come here and pay lots of attention. This is yeah. so exciting. And it wears you out. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> but, uh, I, but you're one that has a lot of energy, <laughs> and I hope you'll be around for a long time. I, I do want to pay you. tribute, as we are in each of these interviews, to those who have uh, done the work like you have for so many years and are either retiring or moving on to industry or wherever they're yeah, going. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of activists that did the same thing for yes, years to, to you know, hold the feet to, to the fire. Happen, absolutely. Yeah, so no it's, it's, it's great to see that. Yeah, so, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Have a good day, thank a good you. conference. Thank you.